everyone knows how to play the right notes, but you just got to choose the best notes and put them in the best order at the right time. So that's what makes a good guitar solo. Hi, my name is Yvette Young, and this is On the Record with Ultimate Guitar. Thank you. Well, thank you for taking the time to chat with us today. It's an honor. Thank you for having me. Um, first of all, are you familiar with Ultimate Guitar? Do you ever use tablature? Uh, I grew up, like, honestly, I taught myself guitar just by ear, but then I started looking at tabs, but I was so slow at them that I kind of just, like, and also I feel like sometimes the tabs for certain songs were kind of wrong, but I do think it's fun that there's a community of people tabbing out things, um, as a resource for everyone to learn learn music. So how did you start learning? I, I mean, you came from a classical background. What was sort of your introduction to rock music? Um, you know, I honestly got into guitar kind of late. Um, I started out on classical piano and violin, and I played in orchestra and everything. But long story short, I got really sick. Um, it was a lot of pressure for me to, you know, maintain school and, and do all of that. So I went to the hospital and that's when I started learning guitar um, as just like a thing for myself. Cause prior to that, I think my parents like really pushed um, guitar and violin, or sorry, not guitar, piano and violin on me. Um, and I wanted to learn music on my own terms. So yeah, I really started taking it seriously when I was um, out of college. But during college, I kind of just like, you know, that's when I was looking up tabs when I was uh, trying to write music of my own and all of that. Um, and I kind of always felt like I came at it from an outsider <laughs> perspective, but that's what kind of made it fun for me. Um, mm -hmm. Since prior to that, all of my music upbringing was in, like, in some sort of like institution with like rules, and you know I had teachers for everything. So I came from this like strict, rigid background, and mm -hmm. found a thing that ended up being like really therapeutic for me, and really helped me get out of my sickness as well. And I think to this day is a really valuable resource to me. What were some of the first bands that really made you want to pick up the guitar and and kind of de depart from that classical sort of sort of arena that you were in? I guess like I started learning. Well, I discovered bands like The Darkness <laughs> um, on a plane. I remember I, I heard some of their music. I was like, this is crazy. And then I got into some punk rock. Um, and then I discovered the beautiful world of post rock. And I was like, wow, this is like so my pace because it's like classical music but it's just like really dynamic and expressive and emotional and then I got into some uh math rock and like prog and stuff and that was kind of um it just I ended up the way I played ended up being informed by all of that uh, uh and, and like shoegaze and like indie I just like loved music at the time and I love consuming it and I love choosing all the little bits of each <laughs> genre and I'm kind of finding a way to amalgamate it into one sound. And uh, you just put out a new record, what, uh, April with Covet? Uh, yeah. Phenomenal record. I've been listening to it the last few days. Um, it, Thank you. Really, really good stuff on there. Um, how how collaborative is the writing process within Covet? Uh, I wrote... Um, this album was, was was a little different, but... All in all, every single record, I feel like it's like basically me writing the songs and then just like bringing it to practice and we all just play it together. Mm -hmm. um, and then with the bass lines, this record, I had uh, John Button do the bass and um, I kind of just played what I heard. And then he's like the real bass player. So he mm -hmm. just extrapolated on what I had already written and did some really cool things, made some really good choices. Mm -hmm. Yep. Is there a song or a part of a song, a solo or a riff on that album that you're most proud of? You know, it's funny is I feel like after I'm done with the record, I just am numb to everything because I've sat with it so long. I really enjoy, I can tell you the moments live that I really enjoy. Um, I think on Firebird, that whole song is just so fun to play. It's my favorite one to play. Um, that one in Love Spell, actually. Uh, I really like the delay section in Love Spell when it opens up after the first verse. And then... Um, on Firebird, I love the solo at the end. It's just like really epic, like a lot of distortion and delay. Um, and then I just, I think the riff in that song is really catchy. 
and that's my goal always is melody over everything else so when I write something that people are able to like sing and get stuck in their heads I get really really excited um and then bronco is fun just for the effects and the chonk I like playing that one a lot <laughs> yeah those are all high, high the same highlights I have from the record so um ah, cool are you doing any more solo material or is this kind of you mentioned you write all the music for for covet basically uh has that kind of become your solo project now or or can we expect some more solo records in the future yeah i think you know what's funny is always my solo project but i just like hired like i think i changed i i got new band members um you know i think a lot of stuff happened that i just thought it was unacceptable to keep them so um that was heartbreaking but with my new band basically runs the same um and yeah i i've been working at this band for so long i honestly kind of need a break from it because i've have i have solo music i've written for the last like five years that i haven't been able to work on just because i'm so busy and i think it's really important to take breaks as an artist and do um have time to like experiment and grow and learn and do other things and grow sonically like I think the reason why people end up releasing the same record over and over again is because they're not afforded the time to develop themselves and work on themselves and learn new things. And technology is always improving, growing. So I think I just want to take a year off and just, I have a solo piano record I need to record. And then I have a solo kind of like indie pop sort of thing that I'm working on right now that is guitar centric, but I'm really excited about. So, yeah. So, of course, we're Ultimate Guitar. We're a very guitar-centric website. But how important is it for guitarists to branch out and maybe learn a different instrument? Um, What can they gain from that? So, so, so much. Different perspective, obviously. But, like, I find that a lot of my riffs come from just, like, how I think about piano. Like, the polyphony um, really helped me a lot. So, I think everyone should learn piano. I think it should be everyone's first instrument. Um, maybe hot take I don't know but it's just like such a good songwriting tool Um, violin has taught me like dynamics and feel and and precision because violin requires you to be very precise because it's like fretless also different timbres of different instruments like cello I love saxophone there's a saxophone solo on the record I love trumpet like and the horn sections amazing um yeah, learn as many instruments as you can. Do you remember some specific instances in the studio where uh, parts were maybe not coming as easily as as they as you had hoped? Um, I feel like I made the mistake of recording the record before we ever played it live, and I don't recommend that. I feel like it's important to see how something plays out in a room. So I ended up retracking a bunch of stuff. That's why it took long because I just went. I pulled out all the bass. I retracked it pulled out some guitar parts retracted it like the solo and firebird like a lot of the parts the dubs i did at home in my home setup so yeah just you don't you don't really know what you want until you've played it a lot and like let it kind of marinate you know are there any pedals or pieces of gear that you've been finding really inspiring lately or even in the writing of this uh last record hell yeah digitech like every Digitech pedal ever, like the the whammy, the ricochet, the drop, the freak out, those are all now like an essential part of my sound. Um, I really enjoy the DD3, um, which is really playful, fast stutter. Um, what else? Fuzzes, different fuzzes. Uh, Beatronics makes some really interesting fuzzes, a lot of characteristics. Hologram microcosm. Um, not cheap, but definitely just like a wealth of inspiration, particularly if you're into um, creating like ambient stuff that has character. Like I use the granules function a lot. The micro looper is insane. I love it. Um, the glitch function is really, really fun for disrupting what you're playing. I just like, I feel like I've just been really obsessed with, I love guitar tones, don't get me wrong, but I'm also obsessed with making a guitar not sound like a guitar. And like have people try to guess like what instrument is that but it's a guitar yeah. and like bet you didn't know you can make a guitar sound like that <laughs> really quick i also want to mention the oc5 the boss oc5 that's a big part of my sound now too so um how did you get hooked up with ibanez uh and then how did you how did the signature model come about 
I forgot exactly how that happened, but they hit me up and they were like, I think I was resistant to them initially because I was just like, ooh, like, I feel like their whole thing is like pointy guitars, like pointy metal guitars. And I'm like, I'm not really like a metal player, so that'd be a little dissonant with what I do. But they were like, we got the guitar just for you. And they sent me a Talman. And I was like, ah, oh, this thing's amazing. It's beautiful. Yeah. And it's got like, I think I cannibalized an, a set of Bill Lawrence pickups I had in my old telly. And it sounded great. Um, and I was like, sold, love this guitar. And we ended up just, I played that guitar so much, we ended up developing a signature. <laughs> and here I am with yeah. two signatures, a third on the way. Excited. <laughs> Let's talk about the third one. Uh, can can you drop any uh, specs on what that one's going to have? Maybe some different pickups. Um, yeah, for sure, different pickups. Um, I don't. I no longer uh, work with Seymour Duncan. I'm trying to f decide where to go because there's so many routes I could go. Um, I think Ivanis has a very solid relationship with Demarzio, and I do love Demarzio pickups. Mm -hmm. I also feel like I'm just constantly like kind of like making outlier guitars and it would be really fun to get Ibanez to do something that's like a little outside of their wheelhouse to I think to attract a, like a bigger demographic because it's like I just think about like my association with them like when I started out I was like I thought they were like the metal shredder guitar company and I feel like not everyone wants to play that and sometimes people unfortunately like I did judge a band by its cover, like judge a book by its cover and judge a brand by like, you know, what things look like and what things sound like. Um, so yeah, it'd be kind of fun to do something that's more like wide appeal. So I was thinking I've done the single coil route a ton. Um, P90s would be kind of cool. Mini humbuckers. I, I've been resistant to humbuckers, such a single coil girl, but I'm trying to open my mind. And I think a lot of people would enjoy a guitar that's a little <laughs> bit quieter and less like you know, um, single coils are, they're single coils. They, they be making noise. <laughs> so yeah. But I think I just want to do something like really different. So, you know, music theory, how do you, I mean, do you consciously discard that and put it over in the corner when you're writing your, your own guitar music, or is it something that you use in your writing? To me, it's not useful until I have to like explain what I did to someone. Um, and that's when I use it the most, but when I'm writing, I don't think about it at all. I'm just like, literally they're singing stuff. I think of like my guitarist, like top line writing where I'm like, okay, like what yeah. something that I really want to hear. And then I like start really simple and then I just build it up to this like complex, intricate thing, but it's just my ear. I don't really like think, oh, I'm going to like resolve it this way. And then I'm going to like purposely write something that's yeah. like in five and then goes to seven like i don't count <laughs> so a lot of a lot of guitar centric people where that's their only instrument they really haven't explored the classical area of music as much as they probably should have um is there a classical piece that you would recommend to a lot of the metal heads that are probably listening to this um you know people that are fans of shred guitar if you really want to hear something technically insane i would recommend wow something yeah. like flood of the bumblebees or something that's just like pure 16th note insanity flourish and it sounds like bumblebees they do achieve that um if you want to hear something esoteric and like really strange that you would never dream of that is really difficult to access melodically i would suggest a lot of contemporary anything any kind of like impressionistic stuff like revel it just flows and that thing just the timing is so fluid and it's also very shreddy and difficult to play. Um, if you want something with insane counterpoint and multiple pol voices, like true polyphony within a lot of rules, I would say well, just any Bach like is nuts. Any Baroque music, writing like writing Baroque music is so difficult because there's so many rules to counterpoint. Um, and it was just really tricky to be creative within those like to write something different because there's so many rules that you have to consider. So yeah, yep. this, this is a lot. Uh, honestly, if gateway, if you like postdoc already, just start getting into like movie soundtrack stuff, like film scoring. <laughs> I think a lot of, there's a lot to appreciate there. Uh, Ralph Vaughn Williams is a good contemporary composer. He did, 
I think Master and Commander and the whatever he wrote for that movie was so gorgeous. Um, so yeah, there you go. <laughs> What constitutes a good guitar solo? And uh, I'll, I'll just follow it up with the lamest question of all time. And uh, what what's the greatest guitar solo, uh, in your opinion? I think the best, everyone can play the right note, but I think it's the question of who plays it. Can you choose the best notes? The notes that are just going to flow in the, in the most effective manner to accomplish the emotion you're trying to achieve? And I think in addition to that, I think phrasing is so important um it can take something feeling rigid and very stale to something that is making you feel things because it sounds like someone talking or something or it, it just pushes and pulls and it never gets stagnant um so yeah phrasing is i think like everyone knows how to play the right notes but you just got to choose the best notes and put them in the best order at the right time so that's what makes a good guitar solo. Yeah, it's not easy. I think that's like 90% of the battle for me. Like, I think when I it's time for me to lay down a solo or a part, I know what notes I want to play. And it's like, I get option paralysis. I'm like, well, I could go down this chat, this chat, this chat. So usually what I do is I like, will sing the solo that I want to hear. And then I'll learn it on guitar. I'll play it. And then I'll start playing around with phrasing to do something unexpected. Or I think even something as like microscopic as like, I'm going to not be exactly to the grid and like come in purposely late like behind the beat and i think that can like so make like if you make someone like you know physically react because they like hold back because they want to hear that note um slower or if you're, you're pushing apart because in they you know like just that kind of thing is like really really fun for me um and then what was the second part of the question uh what the greatest uh guitar solo ever written was I don't know, because that's, like, so subjective. Because um, I think some people would consider a very verbose, noty solo to be the best because it's technically proficient. But then sometimes some of my favorite personal solos have been ones where the tone was, like... That's another thing to consider. Not only your... Ugh, like, not only phrasing, but, like, the right note, but then, like, the right tone, like... You can play a guitar solo on a country song and use like a crazy, like distorted thing, which would work in another context, but it'd be the poor choice for that song. But you could get something that's kind of more like, it sounds all like throaty and like it has a lot of character. Um, and that could be like the perfect solo. So yeah, I don't know. I'm getting really vague answers because I just feel like there's so many different contexts in which something could be the best solo. Uh some of my favorite guitar solos um at the end of this one pine grove song there's a, a song called the phasia and the song just ends on a solo and it fades out and i just like think it makes me feel things it's so beautiful but then um on the other hand the first time i heard go three govin you know i feel like that's like a more traditional guitar solo but it i thought his note choice and like phrasing was really really great yeah like waves Love that song. Bringing it all the way back, uh, what was your first guitar and what were some of the first songs that you tried to learn how to play or did you just start out doing original stuff right in the beginning? I definitely learned a lot of Creed songs. Um, I thought, you know, I think people like to meme Creed now, but like, you know, those are some good riffs. Uh, I learned a lot of like folk music too. Um, just right. like a, a lot of acoustic stuff. I think I started on acoustic. Uh and then I just started writing. I think I, the two kind of went hand in hand. I, I, I got bored of like just learning other music. I was like, I want to make my own. And what did you start out on? What was your first guitar? A, I even had a classical guitar. And then I switched to, I think it was like some guitar I got on Amazon. And then when I started taking it seriously, I got a Martin OMC 1E. An artistic. So you actually started out on Ibanez. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. And then, yeah, it's funny. My first electric guitar was like this... Uh, I've been his RG that I borrowed and then and then I gave that back and then I ended up getting a SX Tally which I still own and I traded that for, for my friend Ethan for a drum machine that I owned because at the time I didn't have money and so I was like do you want a drum machine and he's like yeah do you want a Tally and we just did the online trade I think I have an SX Strat back there somewhere um they're great $90 guitar but honestly feels great what makes a guitar good or bad so 
we interviewed uh, Nita Strauss, and she said that at Nam one year, you guys switched guitars, and uh, neither one of you liked the other one's uh, <laughs> uh, guitar as far as the design, just because it, it didn't work for the music that you guys play. Do you recall that incident? And did you like uh, playing Nita's signature instrument? I feel like what makes a guitar good is it's a very personal thing. Like, what is a good guitar to someone else isn't going to be a good guitar for you, as evidenced by, you know, the, the point that Nita said. Um, but I think context is everything. And I love all kinds of music. So for me, like, I like having different types of guitarists to really you know, explore different sounds and different pickups. Like, um, I would say what makes a good guitar, what doesn't make a good, good guitar, obviously, is the price. Who cares? Um, expensive thing might not work for someone. I, that SX Telly, that $90 guitar, inspired so much music in me. I ended up writing so much with it, and it's like, a lot of people would just pa pass that up because it looks like this cheap thing. Um, comfort to me is most important you ever pick up a guitar and it just like makes you cranky like you're playing fine but it just like makes you never want to play another note again and I've had instances of that where it's just like I think I was playing like a, a hollow body jazz guitar and just like really put me in a bad mood because it just wasn't doing anything that I needed to do tonally and it felt like really bad underneath my fingers um maybe is also like a setup thing but yeah so comfort tone like obviously I think the thing that should matter the most in music is what it sounds like so if you're not liking the sound that's coming out it's not going to make you want to play guitar it's not going to make you want to write a good guitar will make you want to write a good guitar you will like pick up and not want to put down so I'll be like we gotta go and you'll be like wait like I just like can't step away I have a guitar I have like a couple of guitars that are like that for me I just like start playing I always forget I'm like I'm just gonna play a few notes and then an hour pass passes by I'm just like so yeah um and then I think like obviously everyone does care about aesthetics so for me live if I feel like I have a cool instrument I want to feel good on stage you know I'm gonna like I, I have sparkle guitars for a reason they just steal the show they look great on photos. So, but I think that's the last of my consideration. So to that kid who just bought his first guitar or her first guitar, um, and thank you for inspiring so many uh, young women to pick up the guitar. Uh, that's been fantastic. Um, what advice would you have for that kid uh, starting out their musical journey? Listen to a lot of different music. Look at the band. And don't, band. like, it's okay to have role models and, like, look up to people, but... Don't try to copy anyone. And the most important thing is just have fun. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. once you start doing something where you're not really having fun, just spending time with your instrument anymore, it's probably going to be a dead end. Because I know for me personally, longevity in my career has been following what excites me. And as soon as I start comparing myself to other people's career tra trajectories or even like what they do with their music career what they do with their music, what they, the things that they value about music, I just realized that it's like not going to make me happy. Um, and yeah, I think like for me a big, I started out wanting to like be more virtuosic because I thought I had to like prove myself, you know, um, and there's a lot of pressure and I was just like, well, I have a signature guitar, I better freaking deserve it. But then over time, I realized that like the joy that I get from playing doesn't come from, again, sweating bullets trying to nail these like insane tap runs. It comes from playing like the perfectly placed note that makes someone feel something or like, you know, really good melody, something that's like catchy and fun. And then like the, the guitar is so expressive. There's so many ways you can play a melodic line and just finding like the, the most effective way to like convey that what I would tell the person picking up guitar is just like learn a bunch of different types of music grow your toolkit as a songwriter grow your toolkit as a guitar player learn as many techniques as you can but what you do with that is up to you and don't try to like be the next Ingwe or like be the next I don't know like <laughs> Steve Vai or whatever Steve Vai is amazing no one's gonna be as good as Steve Vai as Steve Vai you know <laughs> so 
you mentioned your your tapping technique, which is which is fantastic. Uh, to someone who's never tried tapping, do you have some technical advice for them uh, on how to do it well? Yeah, I think like how you position your hand is really important. It's kind of hard for me to show right now, but like I think some people like hold it like this. But if you just like tilt your hand forward a little bit, you get more momentum. Um, and it's not about re- like for me, it's not about like I don't tap like this. I tap like this. So it's about letting the natural weight of your hand provide the finger strength necessary to get that note to sound out. Um, action, having it on the lower side helps. Um, thicker strings helps because then you don't bend stuff out of tune and you get a more whole tone. Um, and then, yeah, honestly, gear-wise, compression can go a long way. What do you have planned for the rest of 2023? Busy. I'm just like working on... I'm going to Japan in a few weeks. Um, I've been working on a couple of features. Uh, I got asked to do some guitar for a film score thing, so I'm like working on that today. Um, I'm doing Vi Academy next at the top of next year. I'm doing Guitar Summit in Europe later this fall, and that's that's like my whole year, honestly. Um, and the next year, I'm planning to just take off because I would really like to write. Well, thank you so much for being so gracious with your time today and and chatting with us. So. I I really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you for having me.